Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Uh, ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to today. We're going to pick it up in this beautiful book of Psalms with Psalm 135, verse 8. And Psalm 135 and 136 form a pair. Uh, the subject of both is almost identical. And if you have a companion Bible, you might take a peek at the uh, structures that Bollinger lines out after uh, the structure for 136, Psalm 136, you'll find uh, a graph, if you will, showing the similarities between 135 and 136. And as we work our way through 135 and 136, you'll, you also will see, you don't need to look at Bollinger's uh, structure, but uh, the subject, of course, is praise uh, for our Heavenly Father, and, and that means showing our love and our adoration for Him, as well as thanking Him. And don't ever forget to thank your Father. Uh, it, it, uh, it goes a long ways toward increasing uh, future blessings when He knows that you appreciate uh, the blessings that He's given to you in the past. The subject, again, praise, uh, although uh, 135 and 136, the psalmist re, uh, chose to remain anonymous. Uh, I pointed out in our last lecture that I think we see the thumbprint of Hezekiah somewhat uh, continuing from the Song of Degrees, which we just completed. Of course, 10 of those being uh, authored, uh, or I should say the Lord authored them, but he used his servant Hezekiah uh, to write them down. So with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, uh, open ears this day. Uh, Psalm 135, verse 8, and it reads, in the speaking of our Heavenly Father, who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. Uh, those ten plagues that our father brought against the Egyptians and the message that he had for Pharaoh, let my people go. Uh, the first, the death of the firstborn of all in Egypt, uh, of both man and beast, we're talking about from Pharaoh himself uh, down to the man who was in the dungeon uh, even to their livestock. The firstborn uh, was smitten by the death angel. Only the Hebrews, uh, who had the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, uh, were not smitten by the death angel. But that uh, the death of the firstborn, the tenth and final plague, and the Egyptians, including Pharaoh, decided it would be in their best interest to let God's people go. Verse 9, who sent tokens, or signs probably better, and wonders, miracles, into the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants. And of course you can read the history of that in the book of Moses in Exodus, oh, beginning with chapter 7 through, say, chapter 14, uh, goes through the ten plagues, uh, also the fact uh, of when uh, Israel first came out uh, of, of Egypt and God uh, spreading the Red Sea, parting the Red Sea so that they could escape the armies of Pharaoh. And imagine when they came out of, you know, they'd been in bondage for 400 years. Do you think that they had any weapons? Probably not to speak of, you know, just maybe some uh, agricultural tools, uh, perhaps some carpentry tools were probably the closest thing that they had to weapons. Uh, training and military tactics, none compared to uh, what the Egyptians were. But what was the difference between the Egyptian armies and the armies of Israel? God was with the armies of Israel and 
he is the one who brought them out of bondage of Egypt. And uh, very little doubt, or there shouldn't have been any doubt among the people. Uh, there shouldn't have been anyone saying, look what we did, because they knew that, that it was God that had done them for it. Did they appreciate it? Not really. They didn't believe him. They didn't trust him. Verse 10, who smote great nations and slew mighty kings after the uh, 40 years in the wilderness, that generation uh, that did not trust God, that didn't believe in him, uh, were sentenced to die in the desert. But as they moved closer to the promised land, uh, and this is talking about in Numbers chapter 21, uh, 23, also Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 4, where we have Sihon, the king of the Amorites. And they asked Sihon, let us, Israel asked him, let us pass through peaceably, through your land, in other words, peaceably. And uh, we'll stay on the main roads. And if we take any, if our animals use any of your water or your food, we'll pay you for it. What happened? Well, Sihon didn't believe Israel. He came out to make war against them, and uh, God made short work of Sihon and Og as well, who we pick up in verse 11. Sihon, which means warrior if you translate it rather than transliterate it, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. Now, Og was a descendant, as it's written in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, of the Raphium, which we're talking about the Nephilim, the fallen angels. So Og and, and his clan were giants. Uh, the word, the name Og, if you translate it, it literally means long neck. And he certainly had a long neck because it's written that his bed was nine cubits in length and four cubits in width. Now a cubit, if you have a companion Bible, you have an appendix 50, which gives uh, approximate uh, measurements, weights and measurements of terms used in the Bible with terms that we're familiar with uh, in, in this time. And a cubit, according to Bullinger, was anywhere between 21 and 25 inches. Uh, and, and, and in fact, at times it depended on who was king as to what the cubit was, because a cubit at, at some points in time was the distance between the king's elbow and the tip of his middle finger. So uh, whatever that measurement was, that was what a cubit was while that person uh, was serving as king. So if we use the, the figure 24 inches, uh, conversion of 24 inches to a cubit uh, for easy figuring, Og's bed at nine cubits would have been 18 feet long and four cubits in breadth, 24 inches, two feet per cubit, that's eight feet wide. So uh, Og was a pretty good sized lad. And you may recall in uh, Psalm 22, the uh, record, if you will, prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the psalmist there says, the bulls of Bashan uh, encompass me about. And the bulls of Bashan, just as Og, were known for their, their tremendous size. So I guess everything was big in Bashan, verse 12 and gave their land for an heritage, an heritage unto Israel his people, an inheritance. And uh, these both, uh, the Amorites and Og, uh, Sihon and Og, their lands were on the east side of Jordan. And you know, that wasn't God's original plan. They were to cross Jordan and go on to the west side of Jordan. The land of Canaan was to be their land. But uh, he didn't know Sihon, or perhaps the Lord did know Sihon and Og were going to go to war against Israel. But when they were defeated by Israel, uh, the tribes of Reuben and Gad and half Manasseh petitioned Moses and said, Look, these lands of these people we just conquered, 
are, are good for, for animals, for livestock. And you know, as you know, we have a lot of herds and these are good pasture lands. And they asked Moses to petition God to allow them to take their inheritance, their lot, on the east side of Jordan rather than on the west side. And uh, God said, okay, you can leave your women and your, your children and your, uh, and your livestock here, but you're going to cross over Jordan, the fighting men of Gad, Reuben, and half Manasseh. You're going to cross over Jordan and help your brethren defeat the Canaanites. And then when that's done, you could go back across Jordan and take your inheritance on the east side of Jordan. And you know, they didn't only take their land, the, the land of uh, Sihon and Og, they took their houses, uh, their livestock, there are vineyards, their olive yards, everything was prepared for them basically. Verse 13, Thy name, O Lord, endureth forever, and thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. And, uh, this is the same God. Our Father is the same God yesterday. He's the same today, and He will be the same forever. <clears throat> Verse 14, For the Lord will judge or, or vindicate His people, and He will repent Himself concerning His servants. In other words, He'll show uh, compassion uh, upon them. As Hezekiah stated in one of the Song of Degrees, you know, the Lord marks down our iniquities, our sins, if you will. And, and if we were judged on those sins uh, strictly, and that is all, what, who of us could stand, Hezekiah said. And the answer to that is none of us, but we have a, a forgiving God. We have a merciful God. And, and he shows compassion uh, to his servants. In verses 15 through 18, we're going to be uh, reading about the superiority of our Heavenly Father compared to the idols of the heathens. Verse 15, The idols of the heathen, or the nations you could translate, are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. And Nothing made with the hands of men has any divine nature about it whatsoever. It's just impossible for man to create something uh, that is divine. Verse 16, referring to the idols now. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. And many might think, well, we're wasting our time here studying this. We don't have any idols today. We don't make things to worship out of sticks or, or stones. Well, we have something that I like to refer to as idols of this generation. And anything that comes, that takes away from you having time for your Heavenly Father, you've made an idol out of it. It could be a house. Uh, it could be a car, a motorcycle, uh, a boat, whatever. Anything that, again, that you put more importance in that than your relationship with your Heavenly Father, you've made an idol out of it. And, you know, if you don't have time for your Heavenly Father, do you think He has time for you? Think about it. Uh, and, and, if you, and I'll tell you, if you don't have time for Him, you can forget about any blessings from him. They're just not going to come your way. And you might be, you know, wise and wealthy in the ways of the world, but uh, eventually it's going to come back to haunt you. Verse 17, they, again referring to the idols, have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath, there isn't any ruach, there isn't any spirit in their mouths. And can you imagine uh, how ridiculous the thought of, of uh, something that doesn't even have a spirit that people would take that and make it the, the subject of their spiritual life. Uh, and how silly is that? Verse 18, they that make them are like unto them. Those who make idols are just like the idols. 
so is every one that trusteth in them. And if you trust in an idol for your salvation, you're, you're trusting in a lie. And I like this, they, make them, they that make them are like unto them. In other words, they also have ears, but they don't hear. They have eyes, but they don't see. Uh, they're, they're totally spiritually dead, in other words. And I couldn't help but think about the, the bones of Ezekiel chapter 37 where, that the Lord presented before Ezekiel. And he said, what do you see, Ezekiel? And he said, well, I, I see dry bones. And what they were is the spiritually dead. Uh, and they, they had no life in them whatsoever as far as spirit was concerned. And what did the Lord tell Ezekiel to do to bring them back to life? He said, prophesy to those bones. In other words, teach the word of God to those bones, those spiritually dead. And sure enough, slowly, uh, they started to come back to life, bone upon bone, sinew or tendons joining the bones together. And the word of God brought them back to life. Verse 19, Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. And how do we uh, bless the Lord? We bless him with our love, uh, with our adoration. That's, that's what he wants. Worship God, not idols. Verse 20, Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. Ye that fear or revere the Lord, bless the Lord. And uh, some don't understand the difference between the house of Aaron. What's the difference between the house of Aaron and the house of Levi? After all, Aaron uh, was of the tribe of Levi. Uh, Kohath, to be more specific, one of the three uh, sons of Levi. But you see, the, the God chose the descendants of Aaron to be the priests. And in other words, you had to be an Aaronite of the family of Aaron to be a priest, which is also a Levite. But you see, not all Levites were of the house of Aaron. There were three major families of the sons of Levi, and Gershon, uh, Merari, and Kohath, who I mentioned just a moment ago. And all three, the descend their descendants, had specific responsibilities and duties concerning uh, the temple or the tabernacle of God. And back in the days when it was the Mosaic tabernacle, a tent basically, you can read about all this in Numbers chapter 2 and the following chapters, but they were given specific assignments concerning uh, building the tabernacle, taking it down, even who was responsible for moving what parts of the tabernacle when Israel was going from one place of encampment to another, and then when they uh, were to make camp, putting the thing, the tabernacle back together. And of course, uh, after the Temple of Solomon was built, uh, that was no longer required, but the different, tr the different families of the sons of Levi still had specific assignments as they ministered in and around the tabernacle. And let's have the next verse, please. And that would be verse 21 to conclude uh, Psalm 135. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth in Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord in the Hebrew tongue. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Just as the psalm began in verse 1, it ends in verse 21 with hallelujah. And blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. And you know, there's a point in time in the future when the Lord will dwell in Jerusalem again. It's called the kingdom of God in the eternity. I hope you're familiar with it. Uh, Revelation chapter one, 21 and 22 tells us that his, his throne will descend uh, onto earth and the earth will be rejuvenated. The very last verse of the book of Ezekiel 
uh, the last chapter 48, the last verse of that chapter. It states that the name of Jerusalem at the time that the Lord returns there and His kingdom is established there, will no, the city will no longer be called Jerusalem. It will be called Yahweh Shema, which means the Lord is there. He will dwell there again. Psalm 136, again, uh, the subject remains the same, praise of the Lord. No need for introduction as our subject is the same as uh, Psalm 135, but we can think of this as a summons to the people to praise the Lord. Verse 1, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. His mercy was there in the first earth age when one-third of his children followed Satan. Can you imagine how that hurt him, that one-third of his children would follow Satan? But his mercy was there in the first earth age. That's the reason we have the second earth age that we live in now. He didn't want to destroy a third of his children uh, because they followed Satan. He gave them a chance uh, to go through this life and accept His salvation, that of course being uh, Yeshua in the Hebrew tongue, which is uh, Jesus in our language. But He's going to be merciful also in the third earth age. He's the same as I said earlier yesterday. He's the same today. He will be the same tomorrow. Our, our relationship with Him doesn't depend on Him. It depends on you and you alone. Verse 2, O give thanks unto the Lord, uh, excuse me, unto the God of gods, for His mercy endureth forever. And this, I think, taken from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, verse 17, which states that uh, our Father is the God of gods, that He is the Lord of lords. The, he that doesn't regard uh, persons, uh, nor does he uh, take rewards. In other words, you, you, he doesn't show partiality or favoritism to his children. Whatever you receive in blessings and rewards or punishment, you have earned it yourself. You can't blame it on anybody else. Also, the fact that he doesn't take rewards you can't bribe him. There is no amount of money that you can redeem your soul with. Uh, your soul is your heavenly Father's and His to do with as He pleases. Verse 3, O give thanks to the Lord of lords, uh, for His mercy endureth forever. Again, also taken, I believe, from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, verse 17. He is the God of gods. He is the Lord of lords. Lord of lords in the Hebrew, Adonim of Adonim. Verse 4. To him who alone doeth great wonders, miracles, for his mercy endureth forever. And you know the prophets uh, performed miracles. Uh, and, and But to him alone doeth great miracles. And the point I'm trying to make here is, do you think Elijah, for example, would have been capable of, of performing any miracles without God doing them for him? See, Elijah wasn't supernatural. Elijah uh, performed eight miracles in all that are recorded in God's Word. Elisha, his... Uh, uh, the one his, who would take over his, his ministry when he was taken up in that whirlwind, uh, the mantle of Elijah then fell upon Elisha. Elisha asked for a double portion, so he performed 16 miracles that are written of in God's Word. But again, do you think Elisha could have made that axe head, that iron axe head, float on top of the water if God hadn't said that's what would happen? Of course not. Just the same, the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, they're going to have the power to make it not rain if they so choose. Is it going to be their power to conduct, to do those miracles? Absolutely not. It's the power of our Heavenly Father. Verse 5, 
to him that by wisdom made the heavens, speaking of our heavenly Father, all the more reason that we should uh, praise him. He made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. And it was by wisdom, as it's written in Proverbs uh, chapter 8, verse 22, that, that wisdom was with God from the very beginning, just as uh, the, the Word was from the very beginning. That's to say Jesus Christ was there, but wisdom was with them. It's wisdom who's speaking in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22, before his works of old. Verse 6, To him, speaking of our Father, that stretcheth out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. And this kind of loses it in the English. What this is talking about is in Genesis uh, chapter 1, we learn that they, we have that firmament of water that at one point in time was above the earth. It, it protected the earth from, from uh, all the elements of the universe. Uh, and, but it also, and it also speaks of it in Second Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 5. But what happened at the catabol, the uh, revolt, the rebellion of Satan, uh, that water, and, and it was a flood, it wasn't the flood of Noah's time, don't be confused, but the earth was destroyed at that time. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it states that the, wor the earth was void. That word was should have been translated the earth became void because it's written in the book of Isaiah, God created the earth to be inhabited. But when Satan rebelled, uh, that's when the firmament come crashing down. Uh, that's when uh, the earth was thrown out of kilter by 90 degrees. North, true north is 90 degrees difference than, than, than magnetic north, if you will. And, uh, so that's what that's talking about there. Verse 7, again still speaking of our Father. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. And, and of course Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, we're talking here that those lights were placed in the heavens to divide the day from the night. And also they were given for signs and for seasons. Verse 8, the sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. God set uh, the sun to have dominion over the earth, but it is our heavenly Father who has dominion over the sun. Verse 9, the moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. Are you starting to see a, a tendency here? Have you noticed that? We've had nine verses so far in this particular psalm. Every one of them so far has ended with the phrase, for his mercy endureth forever. Well, guess what? It continues on. We have 26 verses in this psalm, uh, 136. Every single one of them will end with the phrase, for his mercy endureth forever. I would call that emphasis. Verse 10. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever. The firstborn from Pharaoh uh, down to the least of the prisoners in the dungeon, dungeon also their livestock. And again, we see the subject uh, almost verbatim of Psalm 135 and 136, thus the two forming a pair. Verse 11 and brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. The Exodus, where God said through his servant Moses, let my people go, and eventually Egypt did. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. And, you know, his arm, our father's arms, are stretched out to his children. It's not his will that he destroy any of his children. He wants all to find repentance, as it's written in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. But in Ezekiel chapter 13, you know, we have those 
uh, false prophetesses there who sew pillows or, or coverings to cover the arms of God's children who are trying to reach out to Him to take those saving outstretched arms. And God says there in Ezekiel 13, uh, verse 18 and the following verses, where you uh, save the souls alive that should not live and, and where you teach the souls to fly. And he goes on to say, I'm against you who sew pillows uh, to cover my outstretched arms. Verse 13, to him which divideth the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever. As Israel came out of Egypt, they walked across on dry land. Verse 14, and made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. His mercy is his loving kindness, you know, and, and love is a two-way street. If, if you want to receive love, you have to give love. That's just the way it is, and that's what your Heavenly Father, He gives you loving kindness, mercy, and that's what mercy can be translated as in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. It states that God wants your mercy. That's your love. So check it out in your strongs. Uh, he, and for you to have knowledge of Him more than He wants burnt offerings. Verse 15. But overthrew Pharaoh, and this in the Hebrew means to, to shake off, and, and he did. He shook off Pharaoh and the Egyptians like a dog would shake off a flea, insignificant. And his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. The Red Sea came crashing down upon the powerful Egyptian armies as they pursued after Israel. Verse 16, to him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. And although they crybabied and murmured and uh, moaned and groaned, he still fed them manna and, and gave them water when they had none. He protected them from the uh, heat of the desert by a cloud by day and showed them comfort and security at night through a pillar of fire. Verse 17, to him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever. And this corresponding with uh, verse 10 and 11 in Psalm 135. And let's go a couple more and we'll stop. Verse 18, and slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Your heavenly Father is in control. He, you know, he has the power to put Sihon uh, as the king of the Amorites, but he also has the power uh, to remove him from king of the Amorites as he did. God is in control. Verse 19, Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And we'll stop there for today. We'll come back and conclude uh, the Psalm 136 in our next lecture. And uh, I hope you're enjoying the book of Psalms as much as I'm enjoying bringing it to you. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's uh, have the 800 number please, 800-643. 4645, that number good throughout Puerto Rico, 
uh, the U.S. and, of course, Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive manner, throwing out negative about others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Serve no purpose, we simply won't do it. Uh, if you mention a specific denomination, you can be assured your question will not make the air. Uh, if you're listening by shortwave radio or via the internet somewhere around the world that can't use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone. Uh, you don't need to Twitter. You don't need to tweet. Uh, you don't need a paper and pencil and to write a letter. Talk to your Heavenly Father. He came up with a way that you can talk to Him directly. It's called through prayer. And you can approach Him. You should feel like you know you have a right to speak with Him. He's your Father. He loves you. And He loves for you to talk to Him. And uh, what should you say? Well, whatever's on your heart and mind. You know, a lot of people, uh, in fact, they look on the book of Psalms as a group of prayers that we should read. God doesn't want you to read a prayer to Him that someone else wrote. He wants you to speak to Him directly from, from your own heart, from your own mind. And you should be able to talk to Him just like you talk to your flesh father. You should even have a closer relationship with Him than you have with your earthly flesh father. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of Jesus Christ, Father. We ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, Father. You know uh, the illnesses that they have, the problem marriages. If it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also remember our military troops and lift them up in prayer that are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, protect, touch, heal, and you should, Jesus. Precious name, amen, and thank you, Father. Let's get to some questions. First up today, we've got Brian in Florida. And thank you for your kind comments. Question, would it be okay to use electricity in the one world system, or would that be a sin? How will we pay for it six months in advance? Well, it's not a sin uh, to use electricity while the Antichrist is here on earth. Uh, the sin is to worship the Antichrist. I don't care what happens. Uh, I don't care uh, what your situation is. If you are one of God's elect, you do not worship the Antichrist. It's just the way it is. And you see, and you know, there times are going to be hard. You know, there's no question about that. But I'll tell you what I'm going to be thinking about during that, although we're not to premeditate what we'll say, I'm going to be thinking about what Jesus Christ did for me on that cross. And being without a little bit of electricity or maybe missing one square a day, uh, that's a small thing compared to what Jesus Christ did for us. And I'm going to stay uh, faithful to him. I'm not going to worship the Antichrist because I want to be uh, fit for the Holy Spirit to speak through me uh, to witness against the Antichrist and for the true Christ. And you have another, is it possible for a person to witness that isn't familiar with the Bible as you? Would I be correct in saying that it's God doing the talking, not me, and since he wrote it, I don't have anything to worry about if it were me to witness. I have a hard time memorizing scripture. Well, if you are one of God's elect when you are delivered up, as it's written in Mark uh, chapter 13, verse 11, you're, you're not to uh, think about what you're going to say. You're not to premeditate. You take no thought beforehand what you shall speak because it's not you who will speak, but it will be uh, the Spirit of God that speaks through you, the Holy Spirit. And again, you're not to premeditate. So it doesn't matter that you can't memorize Scripture. It's not going to be you speaking anyway. 
uh, Brian. It's going to be hold the Holy Spirit speaking through you. It would do no good for you or I to speak at that point in time. Why? Uh, if, if you're like me, I speak English, I speak a little bit of German, uh, and a very, very little bit of Spanish, so uh, I wouldn't be understood. But uh, when the Holy Spirit speaks through you, it will be that cloven tongue, that language that goes out to the ears of everyone in the world, no matter what language they speak, and they can understand, as it's written in Acts uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 4, in the following verses. Portia <clears throat> in Nevada. <clears throat> Excuse me. I bought a copy of the Apocrypha by Goodspeed from the Shepherd's Chapel Library. I heard a question televised the description of paradise in the second book of Esdras. I'm confused as to where to look. I thought I heard Pastor Dennis state that this information is in 2 Esdras chapter 2, verse 7 through 77. In my book, I only see chapter 2, verses 2 through 48, pages 43 through 46 in the second book of Esdras. Do I have the right book or am I misunderstanding Pastor Dennis's teaching? You are misunderstanding and if you got the Apocrypha through Shepherd's Chapel and it's a good speed, which it would have to be if you got it from us, you got the right one. But you misunderstood the scripture, dear. It's Second Esdras, not chapter 2. It's Second Esdras chapter 7, verse 77, and the following verses. Uh, you'll find that on page 68, page 68 of the Apocrypha. Now, not every Apocrypha has that, and you can read about it in the introduction to your Goodspeed Apocrypha. You'll note that 2 Esdras chapter 7, verse 77, that the, uh, the verses are in parentheses, and that indicates that they are taken from a different set of manuscripts uh, than what all or most other Apocryphas are taken from. So uh, you won't find 2 Esdras chapter 7, verse 77, uh, for example, in the Apocrypha portions of the King James Version 1611 Bible. You will find it in Goodspeed's Apocrypha. Neville in Nevada. My question is, where Christ was crucified, was he in the spirit or a flesh body uh, in keeping in mind of the transfiguration? He was absolutely in a flesh body. He was the only begotten son of God. That means he was in the flesh. Uh, he transfigured after he was placed in the tomb. That's the reason when they rolled the rock back from the tomb, his body wasn't there. And of course the uh, naysayers would be saying, well, somebody stole his body in the night. Nobody stole his body. Uh, he transfigured. In Matthew chapter 17, you can read about the Mount of Transfiguration and what Jesus was doing there was preparing his disciples for what was going to happen after he was crucified. When they saw Moses and, and Elijah and Jesus in transfigured bodies, they said, oh, let us, let us make a temple here, Want three temples here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And Jesus said, no, you don't, do, you don't tell anybody about what you saw until after the crucifixion. Gladys in Arizona, I would like very much to join with others in this area. Is there a way to find others who are being taught by your broadcasts? In then you list your town in Arizona, I'll just say. And, you know, we don't, uh, uh, Gladys, give out names and telephone numbers and addresses, obviously, for uh, privacy issues. We, you know, you wouldn't want someone to come up to your front doorstep and ring your doorbell and say, hi, we're so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and we study with Shepherd's Chapel. That, uh, that's not the way we do things. We, you wouldn't want us to do things that way if we did. 
Uh, we do offer uh, bumper stickers. I know many people aren't you know, going to put a bumper sticker on their car, but that is one way that you can meet other people who study with Shepherd's Chapel. And then what you do with that and your relationship with them is between you and them. We're going to stay completely out of that. Uh, but uh, we get letters every week from someone who said I was in the parking lot uh, at a major distribution store and uh, somebody started honking their horn and they saw my Shepherd's Chapel bumper sticker and we started a Wednesday night Bible study. So uh, that is one way that you can meet others from your area. Uh, twice a year we have uh, major meetings, uh, the Passover meeting in the spring and fall fellowship in the fall. And that also is a way, a place where you can meet uh, people from possibly from your area uh, who study with Shepherd's Chapel. Kathy in Nebraska, I heard you say that God doesn't put burdens on us. What is the difference between a burden and chastisement and discipline? Uh, please give examples of chastisement and discipline. Well, chastisement and or discipline are to correct improper behavior. Uh, for example, in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 6 and the following verses, uh, we learn from our Father's word there that what parent, if they love their children, don't chastise them. In other words, when, when a child behaves improperly, it's part of the parent's responsibility to correct the child. And what happens if you, the child receives no correction? Well, he develops into a little monster that nobody can stand to be around for any length of time at all. So uh, that's what chastisement and discipline. And that's what your heavenly father, it goes on to say there in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 and the following verses, is that if he loves you, he'll chastise you. He'll correct you, in other words. Burdens, on the other hand, are problem, excuse me, problems that we either bring upon ourselves or someone else places upon us. But we shouldn't blame God for a burden. And in fact, be watching for your next monthly newsletter if you're watching the live program. And there'll be a newsletter entitled Burdens. Uh, Ramona from Texas. Please help me understand when someone passes away, is it true that once they're gone that not even their spirit comes and checks on us and also that once they're gone to heaven that we are forgotten and they don't know us anymore like when we were married as a spouse is it true I was told this by a person that goes to church and she is a Christian no I don't believe that that is true um, because we will be able to recognize our loved ones, our immediate family, for example, uh, in spirit bodies. That's easily documented in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 25. The Zadok will be able to go to their immediate family. Uh, for them, in order for them to be able to go to them, would they not have to be able to recognize them? Of course they would. So. Um, if, and if you have forgotten them, you wouldn't recognize them at that point in time either. So I don't believe that our loved ones who pass away forget about those who stay here in the flesh. Uh, and you said that their spirit goes. I do believe that if uh, someone loses an immediate family member or a loved one, and they're having a particular problem with it, and the bereavement is just more than they can stand, then I, I do believe, and I've heard uh, people, more than one person witness to me, that, that God allowed the spirit of the deceased to come one time, not an everyday thing or for the rest of their life thing, but one time the spirit was allowed to come to the loved one who was still in the flesh in, in order to let them know hey, they're still alive. No, no one is dead at this point in time. Not even Satan is dead at this point in time. We have a God of the living, not a God of the dead. 
Lisa from California. Can anybody in the flesh speak in tongues? Well, yes, tongues uh, in most places in the Bible, are, it's talking about languages. And as I mentioned earlier, the elect, however, will speak that cloven tongue that's evidence of the Holy Spirit. And the only way they can do that is if the Holy Spirit speaks through them and everybody will understand. You have more, where is the devil during the millennium? Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. Uh, Satan is cast into the abyss uh, in, in during the thousand years. He will be loosed for a short season at the end of the thousand years. Then he goes into the lake of fire as it's written uh, the last verses of Revelation chapter 20. And then you ask the last one, is another name for God or Jesus, Yahweh Shalom? And yes, in Judges, uh, chapter 6, verse 24, we find there in the uh, manuscripts, stay with me, uh, Yahweh Shalom, which means uh, Lord uh, peace or Lord send peace. If you have a companion Bible, uh, Lisa, make a note of Appendix 4 in your companion Bible. Uh, you'll find Yahweh Shalom uh, as well as many other uh, titles or names uh, for our Heavenly Father. Sherry from Pennsylvania. Were all souls alive at one time during the first earth age or did people live in generations than as they do now. No, I believe that all uh, souls were created at the same time. And, uh, you know, and if time, even if it were relevant in a spirit body, which is not, uh, all souls therefore are the same age. And you follow with the second question, when Jesus descended into hell, uh, after his crucifixion, he spent time teaching the souls from Noah to that time. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 will document that. You teach what happened with the souls from Adam and Eve and the other six-day creation until Noah. Uh, I believe Noah uh, was utilized as, as meaning all the way back. Uh, you can bet Adam and Eve uh, themselves had a chance to hear the gospel being preached by Jesus Christ uh, as he went to them. God's very fair. He's not going to give preferential treatment to those who were born after Noah and those who were born before Noah. They're just out of luck. That's not the way our Heavenly Father operates. And who do we have? Michelle in California. My question is, is the seventh trump an actual sound? No, the trumps, uh, you're better off thinking of them, uh, Michelle, as an event. And what is the event that happens at the seventh trump? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, and the following verses. At the last trump, that's the seventh trump. In the Greek, it's very specific. It means the farthest out trump, which is the seventh trump. Uh, Jesus returns and uh, we, there is no more flesh. Uh, you can also read about it in the Old Testament, uh, Zechariah chapter 14. Elizabeth in California, should we pray for this world or should we pray that it go into captivity? There's no problem. Uh, praying for this world and our leaders. Lord knows that our leaders need all the prayer they can get. And Elizabeth and others always pray that God's will be done. And then you don't have to worry about, am I praying for the right thing? Am I praying for the wrong thing? If you're praying for God's will to be done, you're praying for the right thing because uh, he never brings about the wrong thing. Naomi in New Mexico, since Eve was wholly seduced in the Garden of Eden, what was Adam's sin? Adam's sin was the same as Eve's. Uh, and does that mean that he had a, a intercourse with the serpent in the Garden of Eden? 
that's a strong possibility, which would even be a bigger abomination to our Heavenly Father, knowing what he feels about homosexuality. But he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, just as Eve did. Uh, Pat in Oregon, since the Antichrist has not come yet, is it safe to buy some of the new money that is on the internet? And I'm not sure which new money you're talking about, but any money now, the, the currency that's in effect anywhere in the world, there's not, no problem with you buying it because it's not the currency of the one world political beast of Revelation chapter 13. That's the beast system, the one world system, that has a deadly wound. And then the Antichrist appears, uh, pretty boy Floyd returns on the scene, and he heals all problems, he cures the deadly wound, and all the world is going to worship him with the exception of those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's God's election. And I know what you're talking about. You're talking about whether we're able to buy and sell. And in Revelation chapter 13, verse 17, God's elect who do not worship the Antichrist won't be able to buy and sell. Why? Because they're not going to worship the Antichrist as everyone else in the world is going to do. We'll have trade or barter or do without until Jesus returns. If you're doing helping God accomplish his plan as well, never forget, uh, think back in history how many times he helped those who were doing his plan. Uh, he's going to help his elect as well, I have no doubt. I am out of time. I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's word in depth. You know what? It makes his day when he looks down from heaven and he sees you with the letter that he wrote to you, the Bible and you're studying his word and seeking knowledge of him, learning the right way to do things in life, it makes his day. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, beloved, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.